thanks to you for tuning in. Tonight's lead, Elections Matter. People can make a change for the better. We saw new proof of that today here in New York, where Mayor Bill de Blasio took a major step towards fulfilling a campaign promise, ending the discriminatory practice of stop and frisk. That's the police program of stopping and questioning New Yorkers often without evidence of wrongdoing. And on election night, Mayor-elect de Blasio promised a change. We must work to promote a real Public safety is a prerequ prerequisite for the thriving neighborhoods that create opportunity in this city. And so is respect for civil liberties. We're all hungry for an approach that acknowledges we are stronger and safer as a city when police and residents work hand in hand. We are stronger when police and residents work together. And that's not what happened under Stop and Frisk. The practice spiked over the last decade, hitting a crisis level in 2011, where nearly 700,000 people were stopped. 86% of those stopped were black and Latino, and 88% of those stops didn't result in an arrest or summons. 88%. These were innocent people treated like criminals because of the color of their skin. A judge called it, quote, a policy of indirect racial profiling. From the time I was 15 to 18, I would say I was stopped, questioned, and frisked for at least 60 to 70 times. First of all, the, the, hit, the impact on the wall is enough to keep me here. So you don't even have to hold me, but I have one partner holding my arm here, other partner holding my arm behind my back, searching my pockets, lifting up my T-shirt. The sergeant's holding me like this. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break your arm. I'm like, why are you, I'm like, you going to break my arm? He's like, yeah, and I'm going to punch you in the face. I was like, you going to punch me in the face? And he's like, yeah. He's like, and I'm arrest you. I'm like, arrest me for what? And he's like, for being a mutt. Remember, 88% were innocent. This was a system that could not be tolerated, and it wasn't. In 2012, I helped lead a silent march of thousands of people protesting stop and frisk. Ending the policy became a key part of Bill de Blasio's campaign for mayor. One ad featured his son, Dante. Talking about ending the practice, it became a viral hit. Last summer, a judge ruled that stop and frisk was unconstitutional, saying, quote, each stop is a demeaning and humiliating experience. The city's highest officials have turned a blind eye to the evidence that officers are conducting stops in a racially discriminatory manner. But the former New York mayor defended the practice and appealed the judge's ruling. Today, that ends. Mayor de Blasio announced the city would drop its appeal and will work to implement reforms. We're here today to turn the page on one of the most divisive problems in our city. We believe in ending the overuse of stop and frisk that has unfairly targeted young African American and Latino men. We believe in that too. Elections matter. People coming together for change matters. And when you fight for what you believe in, you can make change happen. Joining me now is New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio. Mr. Mayor, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much, Ref. Your announcement today doesn't immediately end stop and frisk. What does it do? Well, it says that with the judge's appeal, uh, approval, with the federal judge's approval, we are going to end the city's appeal. We're going to accept the judge's ruling. And we came to a settlement simultaneously with the, the civil rights and civil liberties organizations, again, pending the judge's approval, and we're very hopeful we'll get that. It means we're going to end the whole legal battle because we've agreed to a settlement with the people who raised the case to begin with. On behalf of young men of color in this city, we're going to move forward. We're accepting the reforms the federal judge put forward. We're embracing those reforms. And we believe it's going to make us safer in the final analysis because police and community will have a chance to actually work together as opposed to being divided by an unfair policy. Because people want to be safe as well as not be discriminated against. You, you talk about the uh, reforms. The agreement calls for federal monitor to develop reforms for police as, as well as uh, uh, making it 
easier for citizens and police to work together. What kind of reforms would you like to see? Rev, the whole concept here is to return to community policing, to return to a model of policing that is very much connected to communities, where we're listening to community residents about what they need. We're learning from them where the actual bad guys are, not the 88% innocent that you pointed out were getting stopped consistently. I think the whole notion here is to show the reform is real. There's going to be measures to work with community leaders differently, to make sure if there are problem points in any particular precinct, they can get acted upon with community members actually being able to deal with police brass directly to raise concerns. There's going to be a federal uh, monitor for the next three years. We're also going to have an independent police inspector general. It's another uh, reform right. that the movement that you and I were part of achieved. And right. thank you again for leading that march uh, in June of 2012 that made such a huge difference. That Father's Day march was one of the turning points. And we are realizing that vision today by saying we're not going to go to court to fight the, the advocates and the activists on behalf of communities. We're going to join with them and make a solution together. Your election was seen as an inspiration to progressives across the country. The New York Times wrote, quote, Mr. de Blasio's candidacy excited liberals with the way his relentless critique of economic inequality in New York seemed to resonate with voters. He is fast becoming a national liberal leader whose views will be difficult to ignore. Do you think other cities will also change their police departments based on what's happening in New York and look at reform? Look, I hope that we set a good example. This is a historic moment for this city. You know, uh, today at the press conference, the Brownsville Community Center, the uh, plaintiff's attorneys went over the decades of legal battles over these issues. Right. So it's a historic moment that we're finally ending that. We had the police commissioner there. We had the chief lawyer for the city there, all in unity with the people bringing this case, that we could resolve this together. I hope that sets a positive example. Wherever else in this country these tensions exist, that there's a better way, and by the way, a way that will make us safer. A lot of people in the Brownsville community in Brooklyn, a community that suffered a lot because of crime. I'm from Brownsville, as you know. You know. They want safety. They want respect. The two should go together. It's public safety and civil liberties should march hand in hand. And if this historic agreement helps to encourage others, well, God bless. That's an even better day then. Let me ask you another question that, that you came to mind. I was listening to the president's State of the Union address, and he talked about uh, pre-K, the pre-K plan. And the president talked about it. Uh, a big part of your campaign was about preschool and about, uh, uh, I think, three New York papers have called on you to make a deal with the governor about pre-K and funding and all. And uh, you've been saying we've got to cover it. Will you make a deal with the governor? Rev, I, I've said clearly, I, you know, I'm a public school parent myself. Right. My son Dante, you saw a moment ago, he's a product of New York City Public Schools, still in public school now. I'm not going to give up on our public school kids. We need five years of consistent funding, substantial funding, so we can have full day pre-K for every child in the city and after school programs guaranteed to every middle school student. That's our plan. Someone wants to show us a way to do that. That's different from my plan. Of course, I'll listen, but let me tell you what I think will work. A tax on the wealthiest New Yorkers. This is what I've been talking about for over a year. Tax those who make a half million or more. It will give us the money we need for the next five years to guarantee every pre-K student that they get a full day seat. Guarantee those after school programs. It's New York City's own money. We're only asking Albany to give us a right to tap into our own resources. But no plan has been put forward by the governor or anyone else that comes near the dollar figure or the reliability we need to actually create this. Let me, let me ask you about your first month in office. Uh, you've worked in city government for a long time, but the press has, 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 has gone uh, after a few things already, eating pizza with a fork, not uh, plowing some areas well enough after the snowstorm. Even if you're running late to a meeting, uh, what are you learning on the job that's different uh, as, as being mayor? You know, when uh, the players go from the minor leagues up to the major leagues, they say, welcome to the show. <laughs> so, Rev, I think it's that reality. It's the New York City press corps. It, you know, the slightest little right. slip or the slightest little mistake, and you'll hear about it. Uh, I think in the end, we've made a lot of progress. We're moving legislation to guaranteed paid sick leave to half a million more people who don't get it right away. We're speeding the process to make sure people get it. We're obviously, we've had this historic moment settling and finding a pathway to settle and end the appeal on the stop and frisk case. We are moving the pre-K and after school plan. These are all the things that people sent us here to do. So if the media is concerned about my pizza habits or anything else, 
that's just part of the, the yeah, reality. And, and you know something else they brought up, and, and, I, and I'm going to be transparent. They, they seem to question the role your wife is going to play, who's always been your partner. And, and full disclosure, my former communications director, National Action Network, is working for your wife starting Monday starting as, Monday, as a chief Rachel of staff. Yeah. Uh, I mean, what, what do you say about those that are uncomfortable about your wife, Charlene, playing a role? Something that uh, some of us uh, always felt she always did, but now that you're in City Hall, what do you say to those that are questioning that? Rev, look, uh, Charlene's been my partner now on everything I do for 22 years. You know, we've been married for 19 years. We have two children, teenagers. This is everything we've done, we've done together. We met in City Hall during Mayor Dinkins' right. administration. This is our life. And she's the first person I turn to for advice and guidance in everything I do. So I'm proud of the role she plays. I think the people of the city love her as their first lady. And I'm glad she has a fantastic chief of staff coming in. I'm glad you trained Rachel Nordlinger so well. Yeah. People, I think, just need to recognize if we've said throughout, she's my partner. She's the most important voice in my life. We're just going to continue in that vein. And I think most people in New York City get that and appreciate that. Uh, and we're going to find it's very productive for getting things done for this city. I've got to ask you about one more woman since we're talking about ladies in your life. This one not as close, but you ran her campaign for Senate in 2000. Uh, that's Hillary Clinton. Yes. Would you like to see her run for president? And uh, do you think she will? I'm going to answer a little different. I know she'd be a great president. I know that. When I served on her campaign in 2000, she was first lady, and I could see just in that reality all that she was doing to shape positive outcomes for the country. Obviously, I thought she raised incredibly important issues when she ran for president in 08. She'll make her own decision. I can only affirm to you one thing. Having spent a year of my life shoulder to shoulder with her, she would be a fantastic president. Well, let me say again where we started. I think today was a breakthrough. Uh, we're not all the way where we want to be yet, but it's a step there, and you have, uh, you said that you were going to deal with this issue, and you did, and uh, I beat up on a lot of politicians on this show uh, nationally every night when they don't keep their word, and you have uh, started in this respect to go forward, and, and you know that uh, I'm going to be watching. I know you will, in the, best, in the best sense of accountability, Rev, and I appreciate it, and thank you again for helping to make this day possible by helping to lead the movement that finally got the elected officials to do what they should do. Thank you. We'll be right back. Mayor Bill de Blasio, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you.